Hello everybody and uh, thank you for joining us with another SACPA session. SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And we pay respect to their past, present and future cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. SACPA is very happy today to have Jason Kinderchuk, Dr. Jason Kinderchuk with us today and on the topic of nav navigating the fourth wave of COVID-19 and beyond. Dr. Kinderchuk is an assistant professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the University of Manitoba and holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Molecular pathogenesis of emerging viruses. His research expertise and experiences have focused on emerging virus pathogenesis and outbreaks, preparedness for a with a focus of low and middle income countries, including outreach activities in Sierra Le Leone and Kenya. His research investigations focus on the circulation, transmission, and pathogenesis of emerging viruses that pose the greatest threat to the global human and animal health. These have included Ebola viruses, coronaviruses, and influenza viruses. Past and present findings from his investigations will help inform therapeutic treatment and development strategies, outbreak prediction, and preparedness efforts. He's also active in international outbreak response efforts, including the West African Ebola virus disease epidemic and most recently COVID-19. He actively participates in training young investigators for careers in infectious disease research and public outreach activities locally, nationally, and internationally. We thank you so much for your time today and joining us, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, all, all of that bio is really the uh, you know, kind of long-winded way of saying I'm a semi-adequate virologist that uh, you know, has been able to find some success in, uh, in, in what they've done. So uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of walk through a little bit of COVID-19, but first of all, I certainly want to give uh, a territorial land acknowledgement uh, for the University of Manitoba. So our campuses are located on the original lands of the Ashinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene people, as well as on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms, mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And with that, we will start on my talk. So that the way I'd like to look at this, and I think the title says it all, is COVID-19 ebbs, flows, and everything in between. We, we know it's been a tumultuous you know, 21 months now. Uh, I think that I've been involved in, uh, in COVID-19 since the first, uh, first reports of an emergence event. Um, and we've seen highs and we've seen lows. And, and I think it's really talking about where have we gone with this and what do we kind of anticipate is gonna come up next. Next slide, please. So if we look at coronaviruses and, and go back through a short history, uh, you know, for, for those that, that are, you know, uh, you know, have biology backgrounds or, or virology geeks like me, um, this is what basically COVID-19 or the SARS coronavirus 2 virus looks like on the right hand side. So it's an enveloped uh, they, they, uh, positive sense RNA virus. They have very large genomes. They belong to the family coronaviridae. Uh, the first coronavirus was actually identified in 1937. It was avian infectious bronchitis virus, um, but human coronaviruses were first characterized in the 1960s. And since then, we've identified seven coronaviruses that can cause disease in humans, though there's potentially been an eighth that was recently identified in Malaysia that looks to have potentially spilled over uh, from dog populations. So prior to 2003, Coronaviruses were really thought of as being kind of these cold viruses that were more of a nuisance than anything. 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1 um, were all basically very mild uh, cold-like illnesses that, uh, that, that would basically get disseminated through the population. They're pretty much endemic across the globe, um, and, and we didn't pay much mind to them. And that, of course, changed in, in 2003. The emergence of the original SARS coronavirus uh, changed our perspectives on, on coronas in general. It certainly taught us that these were actually potential public health threats, but they also could emerge very, very quickly and, and certainly in areas that we maybe didn't anticipate. So SARS emerged, 
uh, and really as quickly as it emerged, it disappeared. So by 2004, we no longer uh, found it circulating in the human population. We haven't seen any subsequent spillovers uh, since then. Um, and then, of course, we move uh, a little bit further through the 2000s to when MERS coronavirus first emerged uh, in the, the Middle East. Um, MERS coronavirus continues to spill over. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how that looks. Um, but it is, high, while I guess having a very high case fatality rate of 30 to 40 percent, um, we don't see sustained uh, human to human transmission, uh, at least in, in a community setting. So MERS uh, certainly is a concern for us, but we don't see that broad community spread um, that certainly would suggest that it would be anything beyond kind of localized outbreaks um, and anything closer to what we see would see with the pandemic. Now, of course, December 2019, everything changed completely. Uh, SARS coronavirus 2 was first identified. It was first identified as a SARS-like illness. Certainly got all the virologists in the world very, very concerned about what we were looking at and whether suddenly the original SARS had made a reappearance. Um, but this has actually changed our perspective, certainly on coronas. I think now we're dealing with a virus that has not only the ability to, uh, to, you know, to cause mass casualties, but also spreads very efficiently in the community. Next slide, please. So when we think about coronaviruses, uh, and certainly when we get into this idea of where do we start to try and, and stem transmission and try and control uh, spillover events, um, we have to appreciate the complexities of coronavirus circulation and spillover. Uh, in my own work, I deal a lot with Ebola viruses, certainly work with, with coronas and, and influenza viruses as well. Um, we keep going back to these, you know, basically these viruses that have emerged from animal sources. So these zoonotic viruses that move from essentially wildlife and animals into humans and vice versa. Well, coronaviruses are a little bit complex. Um, we think that a majority of coronaviruses uh, appear to emerge from a bat ancestor. Um, certainly bats are, are, are great reservoir species for many, many viruses, including Ebola uh, and Marburg viruses and, and things like Nipah and Hendra. Um, they're able to, uh, to allow the virus to persist over periods of time. They don't get sick. Um, and they're basically a, a, an excellent mixing vesicle for allowing these viruses to move from different region to different region, uh, you know, based on migration and number of other factors. Well, if we look at SARS uh, towards the top and then MERS towards the bottom, now we start getting in the complexities of how these viruses have spilled over to humans. With SARS, really what we saw was that the emergence event actually first occurred from moving from bats into animals that were, uh, that were being sold at, uh, at large animal markets. Um, and then what we saw was that there was infrequent or rare transmission from those animals into humans. And ultimately, humans that got infected had about a 10% case fatality rate um, and would end up uh, oftentimes very, very sick and would subsequently spread the virus when they were actually being cared for in healthcare systems. So we didn't see much for community transmission. MERS, a little bit different, spilled over into camels about 30 years ago or so and has actually been persisting in camel populations for a long period of time. Now we think the camels are an intermediate host. They get mildly sick at best. So kind of like a cold uh, from MERS, but they can pass that virus on to people that are in close proximity. Um, and once that virus gets passed on, now we have a highly lethal disease that essentially can spill over to humans. It kills people about 30 to 40% of the time but it drives people into hospitals. And then we see that transmission chain starting through those close contacts with healthcare workers. Next slide, please. So with SARS-CoV-2, it's a little bit different because you know, we've had quite a, quite a few years now to accrue this information um, in, in regards to you know, where the virus or where these viruses have come from uh, in, in nature. We're still trying to figure this out. Certainly, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the complexities of this itself. Now, the issue is, though, is that as the virus is creating copies of itself, it doesn't necessarily initiate um, a really strong, robust immune response. Viruses are very good at trying to dampen down those early immune responses that we have. So you don't see people that are you know, suddenly presenting with fever or aches and chills um, as soon as they're infected. So we have this pre-symptomatic period where the virus is basically growing and growing and growing. It's creating more copies of itself but the person is not eliciting uh, any sort of recognizable symptoms that they are infected. Although the virus is increasing, the issue for us is that you know somewhere you know in that five-day period, 
um, when people are in this pre-symptomatic phase of disease, they potentially can transmit the virus. Certainly we have data now that goes back to two days, even more prior to symptom onset that people are able to transmit the virus, which makes it very difficult because now you have people in the community who don't know that they're infected. They don't know that they're going to get sick. They're basically in contact with lots of people around them. And then two days later or a day later, suddenly they show signs of mild illness or, or maybe start showing signs of, of more severe fever. So in the background of this, the virus continues to increase, but there is a point where we think probably at the either the height of symptomatic disease um, or just before that, that the virus is actually reaching its peak in terms of the amount of virus that's present within the respiratory tract. And then what we see is actually the opposite start happen. So now the virus starts to drop off. Well, if you have mild disease, that's great because the virus is decreasing, you become less infectious, and your symptoms resolve and you go back to normal. And now you probably have some amount of immunity. For us, it's more concerning with people that have severe illness or critical illness, because what happens is as that virus is starting to decrease, in the background, their immune system is now becoming hyperactivated. So there's actually a crossover point where the disease process itself is no longer um, just reliant on the virus. Now it's actually uh, being mediated by an overactivation of the immune system. And that's where we start to see that things get complicated from a treatment standpoint, from a supportive care standpoint, because you aren't just treating the virus or trying to attack the virus. You're now trying to dampen that immune response, which is what basically our bodies are trying to give in response to this infectious agent that they've been exposed to. Next slide, please. So, you know, to, to give some basic ideas of, of transmission and mortality for SARS-CoV-2, listen, a lot has been discussed about um, how does SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 rank amongst the most infectious diseases? How does it look in regards to the most lethal diseases? And SARS-CoV-2 kind of borrows from both worlds, right? So if you look on the left in terms of case fatality rates, it's still on the low side. It's somewhere probably in the neighborhood of 1% to 3% and maybe even below 1% depending on the population that, that we're seeing being infected. Um, so certainly falls well below things like smallpox, which were around 30%, uh, well below Ebola, we're well below uh, bird flu or avian flu. Um, but if we look on the right-hand side, now we start getting into, well, what does this look like from a transmission standpoint? Because things like Ebola, um, while you know Ebola kills about 50% of the people it infects, it only transmits to you know a normal range of one to two people per infected person. So it doesn't move well through the community. Um, SARS-CoV-2, in, in you know kind of being opposite of that, actually moves quite well. Certainly, we think now that you know the the overall R naught value, how many people can be infected by one infected person, probably sits in the neighborhood of somewhere between two and three. Um, but with alpha, which is shaded in the blue column, and, and uh, delta, which is shaded in the purple column, that R naught value gets driven up. Certainly, the for alpha, uh, it was around three to five, and for delta, it's somewhere between five and eight. So, if we think about this, we think about this perspective of case fatality rates. If you have a disease that has a lower case fatality rate, but it's able to transmit much more broadly in the population, you have a much greater risk of higher casualties just based on the fact of basically the numbers themselves. So that's kind of the position we're, we're in with this. Next slide, please. Now, what we also know about COVID-19 is that this actually is certainly a disease of inequity. We, we know that uh, from the earliest data that we got from China uh, in early 2020, that there were indications that certainly people that were elderly or in higher age groups or those that had underlying health conditions would get more severe disease. Um, that that certainly has held very, very true uh, throughout the pandemic. But what we also have to recognize um, is that there's also a disproportionate burden of COVID-19 within uh, our, our populations based on demographics. So certainly if we look at uh, race and, and ethnicity, um, what we see is that there is a disparity between uh, different uh, racial and ethnic groups um, that, uh, that, that have been infected by COVID-19. If we look at people that are uh, American Indian or Alaska Native, people are non-Hispanic. This is all U.S. data from uh, CDC. If we look at uh, Canadian data for First Nations communities, we see that disproportionate burden. And then we have to account for the fact that people that are in lower socioeconomic statuses as well also have faced a disproportionate burden of disease. So 
our understanding of what disease severity looks like across our population is not as easy as saying, who are the people that are most vulnerable? Because that actually is a very, very broad category. And I think we're now getting a much better impression of what that looks like and certainly our ability to provide care um, or support for those uh, groups um, ha has been very, very difficult, I, I think, at best, to, to try and figure out how to do this from a manageable standpoint. Next slide, please. So what, what is our, you know, kind of, uh, you know, light at the end of the tunnel for this? Certainly, vaccines have been the one thing, I think, that have, has certainly changed the perspective um, and the track of this pandemic. Um, this is a brilliant figure from uh, Dr. Florian Kramer uh, down at, uh, at Mount Sinai. Um, Florian put together a, a, a basically this wonderful review article on vaccine development for COVID uh, in, uh, in fall of 2020. And he put together this figure to talk about the difference between traditional vaccine and drug development versus what we're seeing for COVID-19. And I think this picture really gives, you know, kind of says a thousand words and gives all the information that we need to to try and convince people of why vaccines have come about so quickly. If we look at the development of the vaccines, we had you know certainly years of information, almost decades of information available for us to try and train us with what were the best vaccine technologies, but also what were the best potential targets for coronaviruses to produce vaccines. So we were able to shift that period to be much, much shorter than traditional drug development where you are facing a brand new virus that you've never seen and you have no prior information for that. Um, we, we weren't doing this from scratch. So we were able to provide that information very quickly. Global labs worked together. Um, it, it, it was unbelievable, the use of social media between scientists and research institutions to uh, provide real-time data on what they were seeing. All that shortened down the process. And what it allowed us to do was get to a point that vaccines were being developed within the span of about eight weeks following the identification of and the sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 from China. Then we get into the clinical trial. The phase one, two, and three trials still use the, the exact same safety and efficacy standards that they've always used, same numbers of volunteers that have always been traditionally used. But what we see is an overlapping of the clinical trials and certainly a move to try and get data deposited back to health regulators as quickly as possible rather than waiting for completion of the phase one, phase two, and phase three, and then subsequent uh, submission to the, the relative health authorities. In the background of this, what also happened was the vaccine manufacturers themselves also decided that they would take it upon themselves to start developing their vaccines uh, in mass um, while they were actually going through clinical trials. So certainly, uh, listen, I know a lot of people have, have questions about big pharma and, and what pharma does, they took a massive risk in regards to producing millions of doses prior to any sort of information being available, whether they'd be licensed and approved uh, or, or at least given an EUA status for emergency use, um, and basically said, we're going to make them so that if we get approved, we can start disseminating very quickly. And that, of course, is what happened in, in the UK in late 2020 and then subsequently in the US and, and here. So we've been able to take 15 years down to really about 10 months to a year and a half in regards to being able to get vaccines approved. The problem is that we don't want to do this all the time. So certainly we can do it if we need to, but it's not the, the best strategy for the fact that I, we only could focus on COVID during, during the, uh, the past 20 months. Next slide, please. And of course, in the background of all of this, we've actually seen that the virus has changed. So one of the things that, that we focused on very early in the pandemic was the fact that coronaviruses by nature, um, mutate to a, I don't say a lesser degree, but at a slower rate than what other RNA viruses do. They have a bit of, uh, you know, kind of a, um, an editing uh, function. So kind of a, a basically a spell check for their Microsoft Word documents when they make copies of themselves. So that's fantastic um, for, for the virus. Certainly for us, it's an issue, right? Because the virus is able to, to make these modifications and it's very efficient in what it does. Well, what we've seen is the emergence of variants of concern. And the variants of concern, basically what we're seeing is that the virus is figuring us out as, as human hosts. It really has not been transmitting through the, the human population or circulating for that long of a period of time. Um, so it's still figuring out how best to attach to our cells, how best to evade our immune responses, 
how best to replicate in these new environments that are different from animals where it was normally found prior to, uh, to you know, kind of mid to late 2019. So we've seen variants of concern that have emerged. Um, we will continue to see these over time. I think really it's incumbent upon us to try and stop transmission because the more we stop transmission, the better chance we have at halting the further emergence of variants of concern. Next slide, please. Now, when we think about variants of concern and mutations, the reason that it becomes so complex is that there are, are specific regions in the virus that are, I would say, very mutable, okay? So areas of the virus where you can have mutations that actually change the virus's behavior and may change it very significantly. Well, you know, certainly we've had researchers like Bob Gary who have been able to annotate where all these mutations are occurring. And if we look at this map on the left-hand side, that's the three-dimensional structure of the spike protein that sits on the surface of the virus, which is what attaches or what it uses to attach to uh, specific receptors on our cells. It's kind of like an antenna for those receptors. Um, what we've been able to do is actually annotate where those mutations are occurring. And certainly what this starts to give us is an idea of what the virus is trying to do. So when we start to see mutations popping up, we can at least predict what the change might be in the virus prior to finding out through epidemiological data that we now have a new variant that is spreading much more rapidly. So we can do that more rapid identification. Well, on the right-hand side, I talk a little bit about the complexity of this. The complexity is, is that the virus is not only moving into humans and circulating in humans. We now understand certainly that the virus has been able to make its way into a number of different animals. So pet cats and dogs uh, certainly have, uh, have been reported. We've seen animals in zoos, so gorillas, uh, as well as big cats and otters uh, have been infected. Mink on mink farms have been pro uh, uh, somewhat problematic because we see human to mink transmission and vice versa. Uh, we know white-tailed deer now appear to be uh, a host or some play some role in, in circulation of the virus in nature. We're certainly finding it in, in white-tailed deer populations. Don't fully understand how it got there yet. Um, and now we have this recent report out of Mongolia of uh, potential transmission from humans into be uh, beavers actually at a breeding facility. So what all of this says is that our basically our, our idea of trying to control transmission of the virus has to account for not only what's happening in humans, but also potentially what's happening, happening in animals. So even if we get transmission low in humans, we still have to consider the fact that the virus is still in nature and certainly is finding its way into a number of different species. Next slide, please. So let's talk about Delta. Uh, Delta first emerged in, in India in 2021. Um, we're getting more information on a daily basis about it. Certainly, we've seen evidence that um, you know, there's been similar viral loads in vaccinated and, and unvaccinated individuals. Though, when you actually start to look at that, there are caveats in the data, whether or not the, you know, there's a similar amount of infectious virus, what's the, the rate of infection between the two groups, what's the rate of transmission, there are a lot of questions that need to be addressed, but Delta is the real deal. Um, we are seeing that it's 40 to 60% more transmissible than the last more transmissible variant, which was Alpha, which was already around 50% more transmissible than the prior circulating strain. So Delta has figured out a way to really move through the human population very, very quickly. And the unfortunate aspect is that there is some data to suggest from both Canada as well as Scotland um, that there's an increased risk of hospitalization with Delta. So when we think about this idea of unvaccinated people, and why we're focusing on them, the reason is because Delta has actually changed the dynamics of how the virus behaves very, very quickly. Next slide, please. So the question, of course, I'm sure that many people are, are wondering is how are the vaccines actually faring against Delta? Delta has basically in every region it's moved into across the globe, it has replaced the prior circulating strain. So it is a, it's basically a much stronger, fitter uh, variant than we've faced before. So the question has been, well, people that are vaccinated, how did they do? So this is data from Public Health England that was in Financial Times. Um, what we see is that certainly for younger age groups um, and as well, depending on where the doses were applied, whether you got Moderna or Pfizer or AstraZeneca, the protection against becoming infected in the first place has decreased over time um, because of Delta. It is more efficient at what it does. It's not moved it down to zero, but it certainly has changed that. But when we look at things like hospital admissions, we look at Pfizer, 
between the age groups of you know, zero to 65, um, what we see uh, certainly are that people uh, seem to be maintaining good protection against uh, being hospitalized and same thing against dying from this disease. When we look at higher age groups, um, now we start to see that some of that immunity wanes. And that's why you're starting to see the recommendations for people that are immunocompromised and people that are in those elderly groups uh, for potential third boosters is because of some of this data. Next slide, please. Um, so the protection against symptomatic uh, infection, uh, it tends to be lower uh, amongst older age groups. Um, so we're seeing it be more pronounced uh, again across people that are elderly. So again, this question of whether or not the vaccines continue to prevent infections, yes, but certainly that will wane as well. Um, we still get good protection against severe disease, but we may still get infected, which brings about big questions in regards to transmission and how we continue to control the transmission chain, especially for people that are interacting with, uh, with groups of people that may not be vaccinated yet. Uh, next slide, please. And then I'll have you go ahead one more slide, please. And it should be the vaccine mandate slide. So when we talk about vaccine mandates and, and the need for high vaccination rates, we've all heard uh, discussions about herd immunity. So herd immunity comes about through indirect protection from an infectious disease, either through vaccination or through prior infection. So herd immunity thresholds, to give you an idea, for something like measles is about 95%. So we need about 95% of the population to be able to actually stop transmission of that virus. Um, for polio, it's about 80%. Now, with measles vaccination, we actually were on the cusp of elimination in, uh, for measles in 20, uh, sorry, in 2000 in the US, um, but that's been somewhat impinged by low vaccination rates uh, that have been increasing in, in certain communities within the US. So our ability to provide that buffer is not as great as it once was. But when we think about herd immunity, we can't think of it as just this kind of, you know, this fantastic number, this ideal number that we have to reach, and then the virus just stops transmitting. It's much more complex because it takes into account the uh, transmissibility of the virus, how the virus has changed over time, how effective is immunity, what is the length of that immune protection, what are the population variables and dynamics, where is the virus coming from? So there's all these different considerations. And at the end of the day, if we look at herd immunity thresholds from a mathematical standpoint at this point in time, we account for delta as being an R naught, so a transmissibility of somewhere between five and eight, and we assume vac uh, vaccine uh, effectiveness of around 80%. If we throw that in the equation, our herd immunity threshold becomes 100%, okay? So what does this mean for us? It means that we have to get as many people vaccinated or immune as possible, because the fact is we will not be able to counter that um, uh, unless we uh, unless we reach a, a very, very high level for Delta. Next slide, please. So can herd immunity actually be obtained through infection? So infections and infection-based immunity can certainly complement herd immunity, um, but there are a number of considerations. And this goes back to this idea of what if we just let the virus run its course and try and protect those people that are vulnerable? Well, we have to start thinking about the caveats. So certainly, the biggest caveat is how do you identify who is a high-risk individual and what are the correlates of high-risk disease? Because it's not as simple as saying this age group or this you know, X, Y, and Z comorbidities equals severe disease. We actually now know that it's much more nuanced than that. What's the length of protection? What is the healthcare and economic costs that are associated with letting the virus run, run loose? I think we've seen that recently, certainly in Alberta and Saskatchewan as things opened up uh, wide open. It's not only the Im impact on people being able to get treatment for COVID, it's other communicable and non-communicable diseases that people can no longer get treatment for. And of course, we can't account for circulation among children. And then ultimately, we get in this idea of saying, we can't just think about mortality and, and, and death. We have to think about morbidity and illness and long-lasting illness and account for all that in our equations as well. So vaccine mandates have certainly been, been used in the past. We see that in, uh, in the US with uh, all states requiring childhood vaccinations. We do see some adult vaccine mandates uh, in some states. They're not as frequent, but we also haven't faced, um, I think the same scourge as we are facing right now with COVID-19. Next slide, please. So just to end it off, um, to throw up my acknowledgements, my collaborators, and certainly my students, um, listen, I, I, I am, you know, but a small cog 
in uh, in the ship that, uh, that that drives the research that that we're doing on COVID and certainly all of our other research. And, and you know, the vast majority of this um, certainly mitigated by all of our collaborators in, in low and middle income regions. Um, you know, I, I, my heart is in Africa. I, I, I'm yearning to get back to West and Central Africa as soon as we're allowed to travel again. Um, but we also know that time is of the essence to try and get COVID um, and this pandemic controlled in those areas as well, because vaccine supply is simply not getting there in time for us to stop transmission. So with that, I, I will stop it at that and I will open it up to any questions that you might have. Oh, it helps if I turn my mic on. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And that was a really excellent presentation. We have quite a few questions already in the queue, so I'll just start right away. Our first question comes from Mark Goodall. We are heading into flu season. Will there be a combined booster COVID and flu vaccine available soon? Yeah, great question. So the easy answer is that certainly a few different groups are working on it. So um, Moderna has been actually working uh, on uh, on a combination vaccine. Um, they're still early. I think they're still in animal testing. Um, Novavax as well has been working on a combination of, of their COVID vaccine as well as an influenza vaccine. Um, the At least the preliminary data has looked very promising. How quickly we'll get that rolled out, um, that's a bigger question, right? Uh, Novavax, I, I, I love the technology. They've had great data, but when we look at it from the manufacturing aspect, we know that we still haven't seen significant supplies uh, distributed anywhere in the world. So now if you attach on um, an additional vaccine component and have to basically get emergency use authorization and get that moved out to different regions of the world, um, it's not going to happen in certainly in the next six months. I think in the coming few years, we'll see it. Uh, because at this point, COVID is here. Um, the extent to which it rolls to our population is still somewhat in our hands. Um, but but I think you are going to see people moving towards combination vaccines because, frankly, uh, influenza kills you know 500,000 people around the globe per year uh, or somewhere in that neighborhood. So it, it's a major disease. Uh, we, if we can roll that into one shot along with COVID, fantastic. Uh, that that would be excellent. Our next question comes from Maureen Hawkins. Are booster shots advisable for seniors with comorbidity, but who are not immune compromised? I'm fully vaccinated with Pfizer, but I'm 75 and have COPD, but I'm not immunocompromised. It's a great question, right? So where it, you know, where we are right now has really been what NASI had recommended uh, and then what the, the provinces have recommended. So certainly here, um, you know, we see recommendations for very specific, uh, you know, pe uh, people or groups that are immunocompromised and, and very specific ailments. And I think part of that is because the data is still coming forth um, as far as which groups specifically are benefiting from this. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of it comes back to this idea of trying to figure out in this matrix of comorbidities of what lines up with more severe disease. So COPD does, but does, you know, uh, the ability to uh, to still have mount a very strong immune response counter some of that requirement for a third uh, a third dose? And where does that fit with uh, with Delta as compared to what, say, the ancestral strain was when people were getting vaccinated at the start of 2021? That's a long-winded way of saying, I don't know what that looks like yet. Um, I think you're going to see a recommendation probably move forth quickly for, for people that are in high age groups um, broadly to get vaccinated. And I think the reason being is that we know that certainly uh, there does appear to be immune waning on average in those groups. Um, and we simply can't go out to each person that you know basically sits above a certain age and go and do antibody testing to figure out whether or not they classify as that. I think you look at the average and say, the likelihood is we're going to see some immune waning. So the third, the third dose is not going to be a safety concern. Therefore, um, if we get any boost on immune response, that's a potential benefit and, and will hopefully you know, aid in, in controlling transmission and severe disease. I'm just going to a moderator butt in here uh, in between the questions and ask another question regarding third dose. How, you know, we are a very rich nation. We have the option of being a third dose. Um, but from a global perspective, would it actually not be better if we um, pushed to have 
um, not a national point of view, but a, a global point of view in terms of getting everybody vaccinated versus some of us having three doses and other, other people having zero? Yeah, the, so the easy answer to that is is yes. Um, I, I've been a, a pretty loud proponent of, uh, of global equity for vaccines, and, and I think we're really watching it in real time right now, right? So looking at some of the countries that I work in, um, you know, Sierra Leone, I think their full vaccination rate is it might be around 1% or sub 1% right now. Uh, certainly you get in areas like the DRC, um, you know, probably sub uh, sub 0.2%, I think the last time I looked. Um, and these are areas that, that are dealing with other outbreaks. Certainly the DRC, it's not just COVID, right? So we've had, you know, a couple of Ebola outbreaks in, in between this. We have monkeypox. Um, you know, we still have, uh, you know, measles campaign, uh, vaccination campaigns uh, that, that are ongoing in the region. They had 6,500, uh, I, I think, measles deaths in, I think it was 2018 or 2019. Um, so the, the easy answer is we need to do better in these regions. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, there's a moral and ethical component to us actually providing protection. Um, I, I think that that is, is certainly easy to justify. The second part of it is this idea of transmission. So the, the longer that the virus transmits, the more opportunity there is for the virus to change and adapt and, and move into different hosts and, and become more problematic than what it already is. Um, right now, current estimates for, say, full vaccination, so you know, reaching 80% or higher for the African continent is probably 2024, 2025, I think somewhere in that neighborhood. Do we have three or four years to spare uh, of this virus moving through populations um, w without being able to actually get people vaccinated? Uh, so to me, we've got to be considerate of that. Certainly, we also have to be very considerate of our most vulnerable groups uh, in our population. We know how impacted Canada was, certainly through the first wave and, and second wave in long-term care facilities. Um, we know that, that we have a major, major issue uh, in regards to those age groups in those settings. Um, so can we find that, that comfortable threshold where we still have good protection in basically the vast majority of people in our population? We provide extra protection where it's needed to the people that are most vulnerable, but we also ensure that there's equity in vaccine supply for other nations. Our next question, uh, historically, how rare is zoonosis among other forms of SARS coronaviruses? Yeah, it's not rare. I, I think that's one of the, the things that we've learned very quickly. So we already knew that if you look across coronaviruses, they're zoonotic viruses by nature. So they are moving from wildlife into, into different animals. And certainly we see that the different reservoirs are, are very, very numerous. If you go back through, how many coronaviruses have, have actually been identified? Well, the bigger concern is there's actually been a lot of surveillance that's been done in bats, um, certainly across Asia and most specifically in China. We're getting a better indication that as our technologies have increased to be able to look for these viruses, we're finding more. And in fact, when uh, I was, I believe it was Echo Health Alliance had done some work a few years ago where they were looking at uh, seropositivity in villagers that lived close to bat roosts or bat populations that were carrying uh, bat coronaviruses. And one of the things that they found was that they actually were finding that there was seropositivity uh, in some of the villagers that, that they were testing, which starts to tell us that you know, these viruses actually are spilling over in humans. They're not necessarily causing disease. They're not moving onwards in transmission. But perhaps we're actually underestimating how frequently they're spilling over. It's not necessarily that the, the actual movement is restricted. It's whether or not the virus can actually proliferate within that new host. So, you know, I think that is still very infrequent. But I think what we need to appreciate is that there are a lot more viruses and certainly a lot more coronaviruses uh, that, that are circulating right now in, in animals that we simply have not been able to identify in the past. Excellent. Thank you. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Is there any truth to the notion that variants are, at least partly, caused by vaccines? Yeah, it's a great question, right? So, um, you know, it, it's funny that the question came up very, very early when the first variants were uh, were identified. So when alpha, beta, and gamma were first identified in, in the latter part of 2020, um, but it didn't really, there wasn't much fuel behind it. So 
people were pretty quick to say, yeah, you know, listen, it doesn't make sense. And here's the reasons why it's caught back on, though. And I think part of it is because the vaccination programs, frankly, have been very successful. Um, so we're seeing that pushback now from certainly, uh, uh, you know, different crowds that are reluctant for vaccination. Um, to try and, and you know, basically add some misinformation into the mix. So what, what do we understand about variants? Well, certainly the data that we have, what is, you know, whether you look back at alpha, beta, or gamma, um, and even now with delta, suggests that the likelihood is that these variants are emerging in people that are chronically infected. Um, so people that are, were not vaccinated, certainly with alpha, uh, with, with, uh, with you know, the first identification, um, it would have come prior to the vaccines being rolled out. Uh, in the UK. Um, but what we think is that it's these chronic infections that are allowing the virus to replicate for a longer period of time. And the virus is changing and adapting, right? So you're getting new progeny that are produced that have better mutations or are a better fit for onward transmission. The other fact is, is that they've actually done some viral sequencing uh, looking at vaccinated versus unvaccinated populations. And what the data suggested is that there's greater evolutional uh, diversity uh, within the viral genomes of people that are unvaccinated. So again, it provides information to say that in people that are unvaccinated, we're actually seeing that the virus is actually shifting at, at, uh, to a greater degree than what we're seeing in people that are vaccinated. Um, next question comes from Laurie Schultz. What conditions would have to exist for a province to safely move into a endemic stage? Uh, yeah, it's such a great question, right? Um, Listen, I, I think that there's there's a point where we have to appreciate that, that we're, we're not going to eliminate the virus, okay? So the likelihood is the virus is going to become endemic. Um, I, for us, it's a question of what does that endemic nature of the virus look like? So when we think about this, are we dealing with people that um, you know have immune waning because they were vaccinated and they still have protection from severe disease, but they maybe they still get infected at a very low rate? And there's some onward transmission because other people, uh, their immune responses may be low at times. So we're basically getting this sustained transmission. Um, to me, the big question is, can we actually achieve that without pushing healthcare uh, to the brink of collapse? And certainly, can we not only do that w without pushing the healthcare system to collapse, but can we also do that uh, in such a way that we're also not increasing the risk of severe disease uh, in, in the population? So how do we protect the people that are most vulnerable to the disease. And I think, to be honest with you right now at this point with Delta, I don't know how we do this. I mean, I, you know, that's why I said off the top, listen, I'm, I'm a, you know, a moderately adequate virologist. Um, you know, when, when we deal with these types of viruses, um, we're still figuring them out in many ways. So what, what does that look like? What do the rules of the game look like? And how do we not only plan for Delta, but how do we plan for you know, the next Delta-like variant that emerges? So I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I think we'll get a better indication right now with kids. Um, certainly as kids are going back to school, we're seeing numbers of kids that, that have been infected increase in the US. Um, part of that is because the virus is moving very rapidly through the community. Uh, so kids are getting exposed probably to a greater degree. Um, but the question is gonna be how much severe disease do we see in kids? And are kid, you know, is there basically enough protection that we can get in kids through vaccination and through other strategies um, that essentially reduces um, that healthcare uh, toll that, that we see. So again, long-winded answer to say, I don't know if we've established the rules yet. I think we're still trying to figure out what the virus has established for the rules for us. Our next question comes from Denver Florence. What is the likelihood that COVID originated in a lab versus in nature? Yeah, you know, it's, this question has been lingering for a long time, right? So listen, I, I will say right up front, um, I, have a, I have a very specific view because of the nature of the work that I've done uh, for, uh, for the last decade and, and, and more, um, certainly working in BSL-3 and BSL-4 labs uh, in both the US and Canada. So my view on it has always been based on my experience. My experience is um, the, these laboratories are extremely well controlled. So you have to think not only from the security standpoint, things like background checks, but also the oversight um, and also the appreciation that people that are working in these labs um, understand the very delicate and sensitive nature of this, the work that they're doing, mostly because we know that if you make a misstep that you could become infected. And in many cases, you may not have any sort of a therapeutic that's available to, to, to cure that disease. Um, 
So we do our work uh, with an extreme amount of oversight and certainly with an unbelievable amount of caution. Now, does that mean that there is zero risk? Certainly not. But I think if you look at the information that's been available, and certainly if you go back through not only coronaviruses, but other zoonotic viruses, and we look at um, you know, the nature of, of these spillovers when they occur and how they happen, uh, and certainly how they tend to happen at really out of nowhere, um, you start to be able to say, okay, well, the, the historical precedent has been set for this. So the likelihood is that we've seen other coronaviruses emerge from a, a wildlife or natural origin. Is the likelihood the same for this virus, or is there more of a lab, uh, a lab leak type origin? I think the information that continues to come out, certainly the information about the proximity of cases and where cases emerged and how that looked over the, the latter part of 2019, I think it's starting to tell more of a story in regards to this is a series of events that occurred with an initial spillover event that somehow made it or made it into specific animals. We're still identifying what those animals were. And the likelihood is that the wet markets in December 2019 probably amplified that transmission, although transmission was probably already occurring. Our best bet to try and figure this out is honestly to be able to get into the communities uh, around Wuhan to actually be able to test people uh, and test uh, serology uh, on people. So what communities have antibodies towards the population? And when were, uh, you know, when did people start to recognize that infections were taking place? If we can do that prior to those immune responses waning, it starts to give us an indication of, okay, where did we see hot spots of circulation? The problem is, is that really with the politics that, that we've seen with this, um, I don't know as if we're going to be able to get teams on the ground, certainly international teams, uh, in a timely enough fashion that we'll be able to identify that. So really, every day and every week that goes by where there is an agreement um, internationally to do this, we're losing the ability to get insight. Certainly, the, the Chinese government could provide more uh, insight from the side of the lab. Certainly, being able to look at protocols and documents would be great. But we need to be able to do this through transparency and through agreements internationally. Um, the researchers certainly want it. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to whether or not the politicians can actually come to, uh, you know, somewhat of, of an agreement to, to be able to allow this work to be done. Our next question comes from Colleen Quintel. So if I understand this correctly, we must work towards elimination of transmission by some measures in society as well as vaccination. Will we need booster shots every year going forward? Yeah, great question. So, you know, what's odd about this period of time? First of all, historically, this is unprecedented, right? And I say that in regards to vaccine development. So we have a number of vaccines that have been licensed and or gone through emergency use approval uh, that we didn't have previously that have shown high uh, effectiveness against this virus. So that's fantastic. The problem is we don't have years of data that have been accrued to tell us, well, how long does the immune response look? We're actually getting that in real time from those people that were in the initial clinical trials, as well as people that have been uh, immunized through the, the um, larger uh, immunization clinics once the vaccines got, uh, got their emergency use approval. So in regards to boosters, I don't think we know. And I, I say that with an open heart because I know that people don't want to go to the yearly flu vaccine like, like we already have to do. Um, I, you know, I would caution that flu is a little bit different because certainly uh, it, it changes on a yearly basis. It, it does what it does very well, which is why we, we've seen it continue to, to emerge and why it continues to kill as many people as it does each year. Um, this virus may be a little bit different in that respect. Um, but certainly, I think we, we have to think along the lines of the likelihood is we will need to get boosters at some point, probably in the not too distant future. But the fact is, we likely are also going to see other vaccines that are moving through clinical trials right now that probably will give more sustained protection. Um, we, we've seen this certainly for smallpox vaccines in the past. We see this for other vaccines that move through. You don't stop as soon as you have a vaccine licensed. You continue to try to improve so that maybe now you have a vaccine that is, you know, is completely um, you know, devoid of any sort of, of reactionary or, or adverse events, but also gives now five years protection or 10 years protection. And by the way, it does it again broadly against every variant that's thrown at it. So I, I think we have to continue to follow the data. 
Um, you know, I think we're going to do well for the first year. I, I think the dose, the third doses that, that we hear talked about, um, if we can get control of transmission, like we've done actually in quite a few provinces, certainly Manitoba has been able to do it so far. If we can maintain control of that, then I think we may actually see that it actually takes a while for us to get those third dose boosters. But it really depends on, on how transmission looks over the next while. Our next question comes from Barb Phillips. What are your thoughts on Alberta's response to the Delta variant as we approach triage and overwhelming our healthcare systems? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of how to say this uh, in, in a, uh, you know, a politically correct and uh, cogent fashion. Listen, I, I'm, I'm as frustrated as anybody, and I say that with both uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, I was seconded for a year uh, to Saskatchewan, which is where I grew up. Um, basically to help them out with COVID response efforts. So spent from July 2020 to June 1st, 2021 in Saskatchewan with my family. Um, we moved back to Manitoba. At that point, Saskatchewan had done very well. Manitoba had had a really rough third wave. Saskatchewan had gotten control of Alpha very, very quickly, um, but then decided to open things completely. Um, and, and certainly Alberta followed that strategy. Now, their, their arguments will be made as to whether or not there needed to be some reopening to test the waters. I think you've got to do this very cautiously. And, and I say that because of the fact we already knew Delta um, had ravaged many areas of the U.S. that had gone through reopenings and also areas that had had decent vaccine coverage. So certainly feeling as if Delta was somehow going to miss us, um, that, that was built on a fallacy. Um, now the question becomes, well, did, did you feel that your response was going to be able to counter how quick Delta actually moved through the community? And I would argue what we've seen from data internationally, as well as what we had already seen in Canada, I, the, the answer was no. Delta, Delta changed the perspectives for us very, very quickly. And we certainly knew we had unvaccinated communities that once that virus started to roll through them, um, we would see uh, a number of people that were not only going to end up infected, but were going to end up very, very sick. Uh, so, you know, my reflection on this was um, I wish they would have followed the Manitoba strategy where, listen, we tried reopening and within about a week or a couple of weeks, we backtracked very quickly. There was pushback from the community. There was push pushback from public health and from uh, uh, infectious disease experts across the province, including myself, that said mm, it's not the time to do it. Um, hindsight's 2020. Uh, we've got to get through everything now. I've got family in Calgary. They're asking me the same questions. Um, I think right now it is about how do you manage control of transmission, also knowing that you're potentially going to exhaust um, your hospital, uh, you know, basically your healthcare system within the span of the next you know week and a half or so. Um, and we know that changes that come into effect now probably aren't going to make much of a dent in transmission, at, you know, probably in terms of numbers for at least the next couple of weeks. So I, I'm hoping for the best. Um, certainly, I'm rallying behind the frontline workers that are there. Uh, it's a tough spot. It's a very, very tough spot. Wow. Well, best summer ever, though, right? And it's summer till September 21, <laughs> right? Then we move yes, into fall. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help that. Um, our next question comes from Laura Schultz. Can you comment on the rapid testing option in the 72 hours before an event? Is it a viable option to ensure non-vaccinated persons are safe to attend events? Yeah, it's a great question, right? So we're, we're going through right now with, with our university and certain, uh, certainly other universities, the discussion on rapid tests. So um, how frequently do you need to do a rapid test to be able to identify a case and what, what is the timing that needs to be done regard, in regards to that? Listen, I, you know, I, I certainly would defer to um, a, a diagnostics and public health expert on that exact question. Um, my easiest way to address this is saying that um, you know, our ability to look at a, at a rapid test and say whether somebody is definitively negative certainly is not going to be as sensitive as what we get with PCR. But we also know, of course, looking back at what we understand about, um, about transmission of the virus, that people can transmit during this pre-symptomatic period, and they may not have any signs of disease. So where, where is that threshold where you can test somebody, you're able to basically catch them at a point that they're not able to, uh, to transmit the virus onwards, but you're still able to get enough of a signal to be a true positive? I, I don't know. 
I, I don't know. Um, certainly, I, I hope the data uh, is is available, and that's what's being followed. Um, but but I can't say from my own perspective whether or not that that's going to be enough for this. Our next question comes from uh, Denver Florence. Isn't there an inherent danger in vaccinating during a pandemic versus how most other vaccines are used basically as a prophylactic measure? And is that danger worth it? Yeah, it's a good question, right? So listen, I, the first thing I would do is I would go back and say, look, look at what we did with smallpox, right? So certainly the vaccination campaigns, and, and we can talk about, you know, smallpox was endemic at that point in time across the globe, um, but was still considered, you know, the largest pandemic we've ever faced. Um, we were vaccinating while the virus was uh, was certainly moving through the population. So the, I think the question is coming back to if we're vaccinating, Will we see that there is a drive towards vaccine resistance within uh, within the virus? Um, certainly, if you have enough people that are vaccinated in the population, that you basically are getting a small amount of transmission, but you have an ample number of people that are vaccinated, you can potentially push the virus to start to to change, and you can select out for viruses that or variants that are able to now merge, uh, you know, across from person to person or transmit better from person to person in spite of, of that, uh, that vaccine um, uh, presentation. The problem is we still have millions of people in Canada that are not vaccinated and who are not fully vaccinated. So when we consider what this looks like in our population, even though we look from a, a statistical standpoint or a percentage standpoint, say it looks very high, the numbers actually are still in the millions of people that are good ample hosts that have no prior uh, or pre-existing immunity to the virus in them. So right now, I don't think we are going to see that drive towards uh, immune evasion based on the vaccine. Certainly, the everything we've seen with the variants has uh, has presented in, in a way that has suggested the opposite. It's actually true that people that are unvaccinated seem to be driving uh, that creation of variants. So a lot of it's going to be how well do the vaccines protect um, from not only severe disease, but then also onward transmission. And I think we're getting better ideas of that now. Our next question comes from Maureen Hawkins. Why are one or two vaccines in childhood sufficient for some diseases like measles and polio, but yearly ones are needed for influenza and likely for COVID? Yeah, Maureen, great question, right? So um, this comes back to the nature of viruses and what we do understand about them and what we don't understand about them. So certain vaccines, certainly when you look back, when the measles vaccine was created, when the polio vaccine was created, the smallpox vaccine was created, um, these vaccines were, were basically very crude preparations, right? So we didn't have all the analytical material and certainly the, um, the, you know, the structural biochemistry that, that we do now to try and define what's the best target to look at. We basically made you know, we use vaccinia for and cowpox for, um, you know, for uh, for smallpox. And, and certainly we've looked at other crude preparations for, for vaccines. So I think part of it comes back to that. And for whatever reason, our immune systems responded astoundingly well. It, the question still remains, why did the smallpox vaccine provide as good a protection as it did? Um, what we're seeing is that certainly respiratory viruses um, are notorious at being able to get around some of these systems. RNA viruses in particular have ways of being able to figure out just from an evolutionary standpoint, how to be able to modify our immune response. And part of that comes back to this idea with kids that it's in our understanding of kids' immune systems. Um, I, I've got a three-year-old at home. I, I can barely understand what she does on a daily basis, let alone how her immune system responds to, to different pathogens. And that's a part of it is that the immune system is in such flux at that time but we're still trying to figure out, well, what does the vaccine do and what does the vaccine need to target within that specific age group to give long lasting protection? I think we will get a better idea of that. Um, certainly the mRNA vaccines, I think we're scrutinizing these vaccines more than we ever have in regards to trying to understand what uh, they are all are activating in our immune system. Certainly we will continue to do that with, with children. But I, I think we're still in infancy in understanding what are the differences in age groups? Why? What is the difference between somebody that is over 65 versus somebody that's 40 versus somebody that's 20 versus somebody that's two in regards to how their immune system responds to vaccine and how do we better retool vaccines that are maybe more age specific? Um, so that that's a part of it. Okay, um, we're 
almost coming up to the end of the hour, but we have two more questions in the queue, if you're okay with that. Yep. Sure. Um, Laurie Schultz, are there other mutations or variants requiring attention now? Is the mu variant present in Canada? And do we know if our approved vaccines are effective for mu? It's a great question. So uh, I'll give you a couple of answers for this, right? So uh, first of all, so so the mu variant um, has been identified in Canada. We've certainly seen it as well uh, in the U.S. And, and other nations. The important aspect of this, so in Colombia and Ecuador, it, it certainly was uh, was replacing some of the circulating strains that we had seen. Uh, was increasing in proportion when people were were getting tested and the virus getting sequenced. What we haven't seen though is in other areas of the world where it's gotten into, it has not supplanted Delta. So it has not been able to outcompete Delta and basically emerge as kind of the silverback of, of variants, much like Delta has done. Delta completely um, ousted Alpha, which was already amazing. So my, perspe my perspective on Mu is that we're certainly watching it, but it is not outcompeting the more fit variant. And that's why I think the focus continues to have to be on Delta um, because that, that is what is circulating at this point. Now, for vaccines, there's already obviously been a lot of discussion about are the companies going to produce variant-specific vaccine boosters? They're, they're moving certainly along those lines, looking at Delta-specific boosters. But I would also caution with that in when you look at the vaccines, certainly in regards to severe disease, whether you look at Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Lambda, Mu, really, if you look at any of the variants, certainly the mRNA vaccines, across the board have been able to provide good sustained protection from severe disease and hospitalization. So um, I think the vaccines will continue to get uh, looked at. They will certainly uh, continue to, uh, to get reviewed and, and certainly we will see more push to see whether or not we can tweak them um, to, to help you know, in regards to infectivity and perhaps be more uh, variant specific. But at, at this point in time, they're holding their own. And I think that's been, again, one of the success stories maybe we don't talk enough about is that the vaccines are still protecting people in spite of, of this variant that has really changed the world, certainly for, for the unvaccinated population. Okay, our last question comes from Leona Jacobs. What is the latest research on those who received a mixed vaccination of AstraZeneca and an mRNA vaccine? Yeah, you know, so the, the, the latest research uh, continues to show that people that got the mixed dose actually ended up getting, uh, I, I think, a superior uh, vaccine schedule than what any of us that got the just the normal uh, two dose same vaccine schedule. We've seen really robust responses in, in those groups. Now, we certainly know that some of those people had uh, reported uh, higher numbers of adverse events. So they were you know, more tired or they felt more feverish post vaccination but they seem to have very much robust immune responses. So I think that's important is that the mixed dosing actually worked. The problem was we did it because of the fact that we didn't have enough dosing. So now it's a matter of trying to get other health organizations across the globe to basically see that as being an approved uh, vaccine regimen. I think we're moving towards that, that direction. Um, it's just we're trying to do this globally all at the same time. Um, so, so great. It, listen, the, the, back, the mixed dose has worked very, very well. Uh, we just need to get more international communities to recognize it so that people can actually start to travel again with it. Excellent. We have a lot of thank yous in the queue. Uh, Jason, thank you for an excellent presentation and providing complex and evolving information in such an understandable way. Great presentation and answers to our questions. Many thanks and thank you from pretty much everybody there. Um, thank you also on behalf of SACPA for your time today and for this excellent presentation. And before we wrap it up, do you have a take home message for our viewers? Yeah, listen, my, my take home message right now is we're, we're not through the pandemic. Listen, obviously those of you in Alberta, uh, my heart is with you guys. Um, uh, the last 24 hours have been amazingly complex. And certainly from an emotional standpoint, uh, I. I, I can only appreciate it and imagine what, what people are going through. We're not through it yet, but the light at the end of the tunnel is there. Certainly, we have a better handle of where the virus is moving right now in the community. Um, the focus right now has to be, how do we get people protected? And certainly, how do we get the, the reluctant communities and those that have been hesitant to get vaccinated, how do we convince them to, to, to take part in the vaccination? Um, to me, I think we're almost there. Um, but it's gonna take a little bit of time. So bear with us. Uh, we are certainly trying to do what we can 
to end this pandemic as quickly as possible. Wonderful. Thank you. And for all our listeners out there today, join us next Thursday for uh, a talk with um, Maria Fitzpatrick on Municipal Elections 2021. What will determine the outcome? And that's next Thursday at noon. And we hope to see you then. Thank you.